Well, good morning. Makes you makes you really glad you had that cup of coffee after watching that bumper, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, well, uh, we are really glad that you guys are here. Welcome to you guys if you're watching online. Thanks for 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 joining us. Um, if you guys have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter five. We're going to be camped out there this morning, and we're in a series called Summer at the Lake, which is what all this wonderful stuff up here is is trying to trying to display. And and in it, we're looking at uh, at encounters Jesus had with uh, with people around the sea of Galilee and what uh, God has for us in some of those stories. And last week, Dave Hubert did a, a great job of teaching us from Mark chapter four when he talked about Jesus uh, calming the storm when he was at, uh, at sea with the disciples. So this week, we're gonna pick up right where Dave left off, literally the next verse, the next chapter. So in Mark chapter five, we're looking uh, today at Jesus's encounter with a demon-possessed man. Now, some of, your, some of your Bibles may call it uh, the story of Jesus and the demoniac. And whatever uh, the title is, um, it's one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. And here's, here's why. Because I feel like I can totally identify with the disciples in this story. So have you ever found yourself in a really, like, uncomfortable situation? Right? Have you ever have you ever found yourself, you know, one of those situations that you know you'd cut off your own foot or chew off your leg to try to escape? Um, see, I, I'm a mediator by nature, and so anytime I perceive conflict or even the possibility of conflict, I get super uncomfortable, and it happens really quick. And it happens even if I'm not the one involved in what's going on. I can just see it happening, and uh, uh, and and it makes me uncomfortable. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Any? Where are my mediators? Any mediators? We got about, okay, thanks. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't alone. Um, so, uh, you know, those awkward conversations that make you sort of want to curl up in a ball and, and hide in a corner. Um, I like to think that I'm learning to deal with it and get better as I get older. But you know when it happens most to me now? When I'm watching TV. Um, <laughs> I could be watching a show with my wife, Taylor, and, and something will happen on the show, and I'll start, you know, adjusting my seated position, you know, squirming around a little bit. And, uh, and she'll look over at me and she'll start laughing and she'll say, you're uncomfortable, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah, of course not. Do you, are we watching the same show? Rachel is so mad at Ross, I can't handle it. <laughs> and, and I mean, that's, I, I want you to put yourself there because that's how I feel the disciples felt, must have felt in this this story. So this morning, I want you to sit back and put yourself in the place of the disciples as we're reading this story. They're just flies on the wall of a really uncomfortable, conflict-filled interaction between Jesus and man in our story. So with that in mind, let's check this out. We're going to jump into Mark chapter 5. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. And this is what it says. They came to the other side of the sea, to the region of Gerasenes. As soon as they got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. He lived in the tombs, and no one was able to restrain him anymore, not even with a chain, because he often had been bound with shackles and chains, but had torn the chains apart and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was crying out and cutting himself with stones. So if you're a note taker this morning, write this down. Um, when we're alone, we're in trouble. So uh, Jesus and, and the disciples arrive um, in, in, in this area known, known as Gerasenes, and after crossing the Sea of Galilee, now remember, we learned this last week, that the disciples had just witnessed Jesus shut down this massive storm, this, this huge gale or a hurricane type of a thing, uh, with just two words. He stood up in the boat and he said, be still. Um, and, and they had to have been terrified. As a matter of fact, Scripture says that they were. And they weren't terrified just by the storm, but they were by the reality of, of who it was that they were following. Remember the last verse in, in Mark 4, said, they said, who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. So they were still processing that whole event. And, and so they get to their destination, they get out of the boat, and no sooner had they put their sail down than this crazed man runs up to them half naked, screaming at Jesus. So we get a pretty good description of who this man is. Scripture tells us that he's possessed by a demon. 
um, at, at least one, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, he's a wild man, and he's incredibly strong, right? He's the Hulk. That's, that's who this guy is, right? He's so strong that no one could contain him. So have any of you ever, ever seen crazy? <laughs> y'all know, know what I'm talking about. Have you ever looked at someone in the eyes and thought to yourself, you know, I I'm not 100% sure what unstable looks like, but if I was a betting man, I'd say that's it. All right, that's the kind of guy that we're talking about. He was scary, he was violent, and he was intimidating. And he had thwarted every attempt to restrain, to save him, to protect him, to protect others. Nobody could stop it. But I want us to look at something else this morning. I want us to look back at verse five. It says, night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. The story is in three of the four gospels. And uh, in the gospel of Luke, it says in chapter eight, he's telling the same story, but it says in chapter eight, verse 29, it says, though he was guarded, bound by chains and shackles, he would snap the restraints and be driven by the demon into deserted places. Guys, this, this guy was big and he was scary and he was intimidating, but he was also in anguish. He was crying out. He was hurting himself. No one, when, no one does that when they're in a good headspace. He was hurting on a level that I think few of us have, have ever experienced. And he was completely alone. The Jews considered graveyards unclean places, so they avoided them at, at, at all costs. And, uh, and the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, you and me, um, the Gentiles considered graveyards to be haunted by the dead, so they stayed away as well. This man had no one. And I find it interesting that, that the demon would drive him into deserted places, into desolate places of loneliness. I mean, I get it, uh, Satan uses the same tactic with me, and I think, I think he does with you guys as well. Uh, he uses our sin to drive us away from, an, from one another. We, we fall into some sort of struggle or some sort of a sin and, and we naturally begin to withdraw. And here's the thing, it works because it's in our nature. We feel guilty or shameful, so we pull away, right? We, we isolate ourselves. We hide. It's a tactic that Satan has been using for a long time. It's not brand new. He's been using the same tactic from the, since the beginning. If you go all the way back to Genesis chapter three, after Adam and Eve have eaten of the fruit and they've sinned, what does scripture say that happens? They realize they're naked. And God comes down and wants to walk with Adam to talk with him. And what does God say? God calls out to Adam in the garden. He says, Adam, where are you? And what does Adam say? He says, I was hiding because I was naked. He felt shame. Guys, please take note this morning that when the urge to pull away or to isolate yourself from the body of Christ comes up, that's not coming from God. The Spirit's not telling you to go off and find a quiet place and be alone in your sin or in your struggle. That's an accusation from Satan, and it's designed to do exactly that, to drive you out into deserted places so that he can attack, that he can accuse, and he can destroy. That's why in Hebrews chapter four, it says this, and let us, not, and let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. When you hear that verse, we tend to think about that in the context of the Sunday morning gathering of church, but it's so much more than that. We need godly relationships and godly gatherings of believers just spending time together, just hanging out, grilling burgers, watching the game, drinking coffee, you name it. We need to spend time with people who will spur us on. Have you, have you ever spent time with someone and you find that your conversations always seem to turn toward the spiritual? Right? I'm not talking about a Bible study or anything like that. I'm just talking about a spiritual conversation, one where, where God enters in for just a minute 
and your focus has shifted a bit toward heaven. That's what this verse is talking about here. One of the most important tools in our spiritual toolbox is godly relationships. And I think we miss that. And if you don't have that in your life this morning, if you don't have someone like that, please find someone, find someone that, that you respect as a believer, someone who you see walking the walk that they talk. Find them and just ask them out for coffee. I guarantee you if they're walking the walk, they will jump at the opportunity. Our small groups are another way, uh, another way to get involved, a great place to start building those kinds of relationships, right? You come into a group, you get to know the folks, and, and, and you can build that kind of friendship. Guys, Satan, he wants us alone, just like this poor guy was. He was alone and gone as far as everyone in this story was concerned. But he wasn't too far gone for Jesus. Let's keep reading. Uh, we're going to read through seven verses here, so you guys sit down, tuck in, and, and we're going to read this. This is what it says. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt down before him, and he cried out with a loud voice, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. For he had told him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. What is your name, he asked him. My name is Legion, he answered, because we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the region. A large herd of pigs was there feeding on the, on the hillside. The demons begged him, send us into the pigs so that we may enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. The herd of about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank and, in, uh, and into the sea and drowned there. Guys, no one is too far gone for Jesus. You're not too far gone for Jesus. We say it all the time here at The Crossing, that we're, we're a church of messed up people led by messed up people trying to introduce you to the one who can clean up the mess. Jesus is the only one who can clean up the mess in our lives. And here's why. Because our problem is first and foremost a spiritual one. Now, we tend to think of sin in terms of things that we do or things that we think actions, right? We tend to think of sin in terms of actions. So our approach to fixing sin often revolves around stopping something or starting something else, right? If I could just stop doing this, if I could just change that attitude, if I could just start doing this, if I could just love this person more. But our actions are very important. Don't hear me say that. James chapter two tells us that we show our faith by our works, but our actions, our, our work flows out of what's already going on inside. It's not outside in, it's inside out. It all starts in the heart. If you fix the heart, you fix the rest by proxy. That's where we miss it though. We focus so much on fixing the outside that we miss the real problem, what's on the inside. That's why no one could save this man. That's why this man was living a life of pain, of torment, and, and solitude. His problem was an inside problem. It was a spiritual problem. And guys, you can't fix the inside by chaining up the outside. But, but Jesus saw the real problem. And this is where I think the story gets really good. Um, so he casts out the demon, um, and he allows them. Hear me say that. He allows them to enter into, the herd of, into a herd of pigs nearby. And the pigs promptly freak out, run down the hill, jump off a cliff, and drown in the ocean. Jesus sets the guy free. He sees the problem, and he sets the guy free. But there's also more going on here. There's a secondary storyline playing out. Remember, I told you guys to put yourself in the place of the disciples when we started this story. The disciples were standing there and they were still coming to grips with Jesus' display of authority over the storm, right? They, they had to still be a little freaked out. Now, Jesus is displaying another kind of authority. 
See, exorcisms did happen in ancient times. Other religious leaders, other Jewish leaders, they did cast out demons, but it involved an an, an in-depth ordeal, right, of purifying oneself, burning incense, reciting psalms and other passages of scripture. And it usually took a long time and was an, an exhausting, messy ordeal. But the key to the exorcism was forcing the demon, the hardest part, was forcing the demon to identify itself, to give up its name. And then using the power of its own name, they would cast it, they would cast it out of the individual. But that's not what Jesus does. Let's look at this in verse nine. What's your name? He asked him. My name is Legion, he answered, because we are many. All Jesus has to do is ask a question. No incense, no, no reading long passage of scripture, no purification, nothing. Just a question. Now, he didn't need to ask that question, but remember what I asked you. Put yourself in the place of the disciples standing there. He did it because he knew that the disciples would know, would immediately have understood what was going on the moment that that demon identified itself. Jesus is showing the disciples that he is in, he has complete authority. He's shown them that he controls uh, nature, Now he's letting them know that he controls the spiritual world as well. He controls nature. He controls the spiritual world. He controls everything. And don't miss this. It's not even a fight, right? There's no no back and forth between Jesus and the demon. Jesus isn't isn't struggling in in this, this interaction. And I think sometimes we give Satan too much credit. Yes, scripture does say that he's prowling around like a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour. And he should never be taken lightly. But don't misunderstand. There's not some cosmic wrestling match going on between God and Satan where Satan might find some slick new move or or some some loophole and and win the fight. This is not one of those televisions that you television shows that you see where where the demons are working a plan and the humans have to do the right thing or they might conquer heaven. It's not going to happen. He's lost. He has no power except that which God allows him to have. You notice in the interaction, Jesus isn't like, you guys come back here. We got to finish talking. You don't go to those pigs yet. That's not what happened. If you go back and read it, they beg him. The word beg is used like four or five times. They beg not to be destroyed. They beg to be released. Jesus is in complete control. Look at what Ephesians 6 says. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. Guys, our God doesn't struggle. Who struggles here? Anyone? We do, that's right. We struggle, it's our sin nature. We're the ones that struggle, not Jesus. The war's over. So, and don't ever doubt it. If you're a follower of Christ, you're on the winning side, right? That should give you strength. That should give you hope. Check this out. Now, when I put this in here, I cried when I typed it out. So I need you to know that I might cry when I read it and I apologize ahead of time, but maybe I won't. We'll see. Here we go. This is in Revelation 19. I want you to hear this. It starts in verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened. I'm not going to make it. And there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True. And with justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. 
He will rule them with an iron rod. He will also trample the winepress at the fierce anger of God the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh. King of kings and Lord of lords. Guys, that writer is Jesus. That's who the demon saw. That's why he cowered in fear. That's who rescued the man that everyone knew was beyond help. That's who willingly went to the cross and died for us. He's a warrior king who sets captives free, and he can do that for you today. All you need to do is ask. Let's keep reading. In verse 14, the men who tended them ran off and reported in the town and the countryside, and the people went to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the man who had been demon-possessed sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Guys, desperate need demands radical change. He was a changed man. His encounter with Jesus had left him different. He was changed physically. He wasn't running around half naked in a graveyard. He was clothed and sitting at the feet of Jesus. He was changed emotionally. No longer was he crying out in anguish and loneliness. And most importantly, and I would argue this change affects the rest, he was changed spiritually. He was no longer fighting a spiritual force that he couldn't conquer. Guys, he was clothed, he was peaceful, and he was finally seeing things clearly. Jesus changes everything. And he'd also gotten a clear view of his need after meeting Jesus. Look at verse 18. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged him earnestly that he might remain with him. Jesus had saved him, and he wanted to stay in Jesus' presence. Right? He understood how desperately he needed Jesus, and he wanted to remain near. And I think for us, uh, it, 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 it's easy for us to forget or, or to downplay our own need, especially if you've been a believer for, for, for any period of time. It's easy for us to forget how desperate our situation is without Jesus. Notice I said is, not was. That's one of the reasons that we receive communion every Sunday, so that we, we remember every week that our sin is paid for by Jesus. And we never move away from Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. Jesus paid our spiritual debt. We're forgiven, we're clean, and we're changed. An awareness of our constant need for salvation, it moves us closer to Jesus, the source of our salvation. So when Satan accuses us, because he will, when Satan accuses us, you're such a sinner, you don't deserve to be with Jesus, we can say, yeah, you're right, I don't. But he paid my debt and I've been washed white as snow. I've been forgiven, so back off. I'm afraid that many of us have adopted too small a view of Jesus. We, we only see the suffering savior. And while he did suffer and die for us, he's not on the cross anymore. Hebrews 7 says that he's enthroned in power, that he's pouring out his forgiveness and his power into our lives through the Holy Spirit so that we can live marked by change and holiness. But I think too often, I think we doubt that. So we wind up living day to day like a broken man running around in a graveyard. He saved me from my sin, but, but can my life really look that different? I mean, how changed am I really gonna be? Well, the end of 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14 says this, what fellowship does light have with darkness? When Jesus changes us, we become as different as light is from dark. That's pretty different. We're, we're set apart. We're supposed to be different. And different can be scary. Change scares us. Anyone afraid of change? 
y'all don't want to put your hands up because you got to move my hands. That's a change, right? <laughs> y'all are laughing, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, let's keep reading. Look at the end of verse 15. They came to Jesus and saw the man who had been demon-possessed sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told them about the pigs, and they begged him to leave their region. Guys, the sad thing is not everyone sees life change the same way. You see, these folks in this region, they were pig farmers, and they had lost a major portion of their income. And on top of that, they had just witnessed an exorcism. So they were scared. And so when they looked at Jesus, they didn't see salvation like the demon-possessed man did. They only saw what they'd lost. And they couldn't get past their momentary loss to the eternal gain that was right there waiting for them. Pigs were their livelihood. And losing that was too big a hurdle for them to get over. The man's change scared them because it meant that their lives could change too. Fear has a way of causing us to, to pull away. When, when something scares us, we just tend to avoid it, right? Um, my family and I went to Michigan, I guess, two weeks ago for vacation. We always go south for vacation. We'd never gone north, so we figured we'd try that. And, uh, and it was a great trip. And uh, while we were there, uh, we went to Sleeping Bear Dunes National Park, right? Now, I don't know if uh, any of you have ever been there before. Anyone ever been to Sleeping Bear Dunes? Okay. I wasn't prepared for it, okay? Sure, it's beautiful and, and it's breathtaking and I've never seen anything like it, but it's also really high, disorienting, and basically a sand-covered death trap. I'm not kidding. You get there by walking up this trail, right? And as you crest the top of what appears, what appears to be just a big hill, right? You're confronted with a 460-foot vertical drop that appears to be straight down. But what's strange, and this is the part that really messed with me, what's strange is you can see people climbing on it. Right, A lot of people up and down and back and forth, basically on a vertical wall of sand, like a whole, like, I don't know, a bunch of sand spiders or something. It's, it's, I don't know if that's a thing, but I feel like it should be. Um, so, so I look around some, we get to the top and I look around some, and then I spend a fair amount of time reading the very large warning sign about climbing on the dunes and the threat of death and, and the cost of possible rescue. Um, all the while, I'm taking very, very measured steps. I, I, and I'm not just joking around. I was honestly nervous. I was honestly scared. And so I'm standing there. Then I look to my right, and I see my son, Ryland, go flying by me at a full gallop, launching himself into the air over the top of this ridge. And after what I perceive to be about a 60-foot flight in the air, hit the sand and go flying down this dune. Now, as a father, I'd like to say that I immediately took off after him in a rescue attempt. <laughs> but really, um, I stood there for about a minute. I said a prayer for deliverance. Um, and then I carefully waded out onto the dune, right, while screaming like a little girl for him to stop. <laughs> Guys, that's what Jesus is calling us to. Following Christ can be scary. It's definitely costly. And it demands change in our lives. And guess what? That change isn't a one-time thing. It's every day we should be growing and changing more and more to be like him. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says, We all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. You see it from glory to glory. He's never done with us. You never arrive as a believer. It's not enough to rest in the fact that you've been redeemed. Yes, if you are a follower of Christ, you've been redeemed, but we don't get saved and then sit down. 
We move forward. It's not a one-time thing. We're called to grow in our faith. And that's what Jesus, remember the disciples we, we talked about, that's what Jesus was doing with the disciples in this story. He was revealing more and more of himself and who he was. He's not just the Messiah, but God in the flesh. And he was asking them to grow in their understanding of him. And he's asking us to do the same thing today. But what will people think? Well, it's not about other people. This is about you and Jesus. No one else is gonna stand with you before God and help you give an account of your life when you pass from this life into the next. Well, what if I need to change? What what will my life be like if I need to give up? Whatever. Let me ask you a question. Who do you think came out the winner in this story? The frightened villagers afraid of what they might lose or the man who was given freedom and redemption from his oppression? Well, what if I try and I fail and I fall flat on my face? Let me ask you guys a question. Who in this room has tried and failed and fallen flat on your face? It's not hypothetical. Yeah. Look around. No, put them up, put them up. Let's just be honest here. Let's put them up. All right, I want everybody to look around. You're in good company. Scripture says that his, uh, th- that his graces are new every morning. You mess up today, his grace is there tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next. You can't use it up. It's inexhaustible grace. John 10.10, 10, this is Jesus talking. He says, I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance. That's the life that Jesus is calling us to a life more full than we could ever imagine, not one full of fear and shame or or loneliness. But it's not something that he's gonna force on us. Jesus isn't going to kick down the door to your heart and force his way in. Guys, he's not a bully. Look at verses 17 and 18. Then they began to beg him to leave their region. In just the beginning of verse 18, as he was getting into the boat, in their fear, they begged him to leave. And to me, and to me what is one of the saddest passages of scripture in verse 18, he did. He left them to their lives. They had abundant life right in front of them. And instead of embracing it, instead of leaping out in faith, they chose pigs. Guys, I beg you this morning, don't pull away. Don't let fear or shame push you into some dark corner. The life that Jesus has for us isn't one of half measures. It's one of abundance. He wants you to trust him today. It's if if that's where you find yourself this morning, living a life of half measures, I submit to you that you need to make a change. Maybe it's time for you uh, to stop trying to clean your life up by yourself. I'm here to tell you, you can't do it. Jesus is the only one who can clean up your mess. Come, confess that you've been trying to do it on your own and let Jesus do what only he can do. Maybe Maybe this morning you you need to to, to recommit to God's word. Satan is going to lie to you and he is going to accuse you. And if you don't know what God's word says about you, you're a prime target to buy into his lies. Or maybe this morning you'd say, Jay, I've never given my life to Christ at all. Some of this stuff that you've been saying makes sense, but a lot of it I don't quite understand. Well, We've got people here this morning that would love nothing more than to talk with you about what following Jesus looks like. Maybe there's something else that, that you need to deal with this morning that I, that I didn't list or didn't mention. Uh, we're gonna sing one final song and every week we say that we've got people standing at the crosses to our left and, and, and to our right and I want you guys to know that they're here for you. If you'd like to talk with someone about what God is saying, you today, uh, saying to you today as we sing, just as we stand up and sing, just make your way over to them. They're here 
today so that you don't have to be alone if you don't want to. Sure, you, you, you can make a commitment to Christ right there in your seat, but there's something about taking a physical step of faith that can reinforce an internal decision. I'm gonna pray, and, and, and as, uh, as we sing, you're, you're welcome to come down um, and, and go to the crosses. Let us step out into that life of abundance today. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we come to you thanking you that, that you see us just as we are and you know exactly what we need. Thank you that you're no longer on the cross, but that you're reigning in power and you're pouring that power out into our lives. That is available to us today. God, I ask you if you would give us the faith to trust that you can change our hearts, you can change our desires, and you can meet any need that we could ever bring before you. I ask you to enter in this morning and move in us. Speak to us. And Father, please help us to respond to you today. Amen.